For the past two episodes, uh, we've been looking at Scotus's contribution to medieval philosophy. First, we looked at his argument for the existence of God. Second, we looked at his contribution to two related medieval metaphysical debates, um, the uh, problem of universals and the problem of individuation. For this episode, I want to take a step back and I want to look at two larger metaphysical debates within medieval philosophy, uh, which Scotus uh, jumps in on. Uh, each of these debates. Uh, but I want to talk about the larger debate um, about what the question really is that the medievals are considering. What are the different views on offer? What are some of the main arguments for or against various views? Both of these metaphysical debates have to do with hylomorphism, the theory of things according to which they are composed of both matter and form. But the two debates are about slightly different things. So or different aspects of hylomorphism. The first debate is the plurality of substantial forms debate about how many substantial forms there are in a particular thing. The second debate I want to talk about is the debate over how best to understand the metaphysical composition of angels. So uh, if you thought that in a medieval philosophy course we're going to get to questions about uh, the nature of angels, well you won't be disappointed today. So let's go through the plurality of substantial forms debate. Um, the first resources that I'm, resource that I'm going to be using for introducing the plurality of substantial forms debate is I'm going to look at uh, a presentation that I gave uh, a couple years ago. Dr. Bungum and I gave the Aquinas Gala uh, debate. Um, one of the sessions was me versus Dr. Bungum on precisely this topic, the plurality of substantial forms. He took uh, the position of there being just one substantial form in each uh, material substance. I tried to argue in favor of, or at least consider the arguments in favor of plurality, there being more than one substantial form in a material substance. So I want to go through my presentation there and I want to add to it uh, to round out uh, the discussion. And the debate about plurality of substantial forms, I want to stick to understanding how many substantial forms there are in human beings in particular. Um, the debate is a larger one about material substances in general, but I want to go in specifically for how we are to approach this debate with respect to the human person. So how many substantial forms are there in a human being? Are there many substantial forms in a human being or is there just one? The question of how many substantial forms there are in a human being is a very nice philosophical question for Catholic philosophers as it was for medieval philosophers. It is a good philosophical question because it is outside of the scope of revelation. And there is no clear doctrinal pronouncement either way. To my knowledge, none of the positions in this debate are explicitly anathematized. One called to hold either or any of the available positions openly and still be in full communion with the church. Indeed, this question has been long debated among Orthodox Catholic philosophers and theologians. There were key figures on both sides of this debate throughout the medieval period, and contemporary Catholic philosophers and theologians continue to debate this issue today. This is one of those debates, then, that Catholic philosophers are free to explore in good faith. This is not to say that nothing hangs on this debate, as will become clear through the course of our discussion. Whether there are many substantial forms in a human being, or just one, bears on issues such as how we are related to our bodies, whether certain theological claims are strictly speaking true, and whether a hylomorphic account of the human person is scientifically plausible today. For the sake of this debate, and here I'm reading from the transcript from that debate, we can understand the question above to have two possible answers. Either there are many substantial forms in a human being, or there is just one. Dr. Bungum represented the Unitarian view, the view there is just one substantial form in a human being. This is the position of St. Thomas Aquinas, as well as many of his followers. I represented the pluralist view, the view that there are many substantial forms in a human being. This is the position of Blessed John Don Scotus, William of Ockham, and several others in the Franciscan school, though not, it's not limited to those in the Franciscan school. And indeed, there were several Dominicans also who thought that Aquinas was right about a bunch of things, but wrong about this. And indeed, the Unitarian, Unitarian position is, for a large portion of medieval philosophy, a minority view. What is the Unitarian view? Well, on the Unitarian view, the rational soul serves as the substantial form for the human being whose soul it is, and the substantial form for every one of his or her parts. Every one of a human being's parts depends for its existence and its identity on the human being's rational soul. 
Separated from the human being, then, no part remains what it is. No part remains in existence at all. And once the rational soul departs from the body at death, nothing of what remains, not the body, not any of the organs, not any of the molecules or atoms, nor any of the quarks or leptons, nor any of the accidental forms, is the same as what was there before. Prime matter remains, but prime matter is a purely potential substratum, a sort of abstract postulate, which by definition has no positive and certainly no observable features on its own. And so anything you can point to after the death of a human being is altogether new. If the Unitarian view is wrong, and there is at least one other substantial form in a human being other than his or her rational soul, what, that, what might that substantial form be? What would it mean to say that there's even more than one substantial form, more than one essential form within a thing? Importantly, there are several other kinds of substantial forms that a human being might be said to have other than his or her rational soul. And so there are several ways of rejecting the Unitarian view. First, one can hold that there is, one, there is more than one soul in a human being. Besides the rational soul, a human being might also possess a sentient soul, a kind of soul possessed by non-rational animals, and or a nutritive soul, a kind of soul possessed by plants. Second, one could hold that a human being's bodily organs have their own substantial forms, as Scotus appears to do. The heart, for instance, or the brain, or the liver may have its own substantial form that makes it what it is independent from the rational soul. Third, one could hold that the molecules or atoms or subatomic particles that compose a human being have their own substantial forms. Each water molecule or each electron, for instance, may have its own substantial form that makes it what it is, independent from the rational soul. Fourth, one could say that there is a separate form for the body, a substantial form of corporeity that would allow the same body to exist after the departure of the rational soul. Importantly, if there are any one of these other substantial forms, if any of these parts have their own substantial forms, or if the body can exist even without the soul, then the Unitarian view is false. What reasons might there be then to think that there are any of these other substantial forms in the human being? And here I list several. Uh, maybe I'll go through all of them, maybe spend a few more uh, minutes on some of the key ones. Here are some arguments that are given by some authors in favor of there being other souls. Here's something we might call the argument from internal conflict. The idea here is we often have the experience of our animal natures pulling us toward a particular end and our rational natures pulling us toward a contrary end, both at the same time. Substantial forms confer direction to an end. And so this internal conflict might be evidence that there are actually at least two souls within a human person. Occam seems to have something like this sort of argument. How about the argument from generation and corruption? Aquinas holds that the embryo first has a nutritive soul, and then a sentient soul, and then a rational soul. At each stage, a substantial change occurs, such that there is an entirely new entity with entirely new parts. He holds that the reverse often happens at the end of life. It seems that a more plausible description of the processes of generation and corruption is one that maintains continuity of the parts at each juncture. A pluralist, someone who thinks that there are more than one substantial form, and indeed more than one soul, can say that the souls involved are stacked during the process of generation rather than replaced, such that at the end, a human being has three souls, two of which were there before the third. At the opposite end of life, the process of corruption may be an unstacking of those souls without wholesale change of parts. What about arguments in favor of organs having their own substantial forms, uh, as um, Occam seems to have? Here's a more contemporary argument that one can give for thinking that organs have their own substantial forms. Medievals didn't know about the possibility of organ transplantation, but I think it's a really interesting question to consider what a Unitarian would have to say about organ transplantation. So consider this the argument from organ transplantation. It seems as if a heart or a kidney mid-transplant is still a heart or a kidney, even though it is separated from the human being's rational soul. For if it were not a heart or a kidney, then strictly speaking, there would be no heart or kidney transplants and no liver transplants or blood transfusions or skin grafts either for similar reasons. Here's a similar argument, the argument from lab-grown organs. It seems as if it is possible to grow a human liver or kidney or tissue in a lab, a human liver which has nevertheless never been and may never be a part of a human being. And so it looks like these organs ought to have their own substantial forms. And so when placed in a body, right, it seems like they ought to continue to possess their own substantial forms. Here's a theological argument, the argument from the veneration of relics. This is one that comes up in the medieval period. 
If the Unitarian view is correct, then the bones, limbs, or blood of the saints that we venerate are not really the bones, limbs, or bloods of the saints. In fact, they are not bones, limbs, or blood at all. The only connection they have to the saints is their prime matter, and prime matter is not a proper object of veneration. There was much laughing when I introduced that one there. How about arguments in favor of molecules or atoms having their own substantial forms? And here, too, these are not arguments that the medievals might have uh, actually offered, given that they wouldn't have known about uh, chemistry or physics, but they are arguments that we today might pose in favor of the plurality view. Here's the argument from empirical tracking. It seems as if we can track a water molecule or some other small molecule or atom through the process of becoming a part of the human being and then ceasing to be a part of the human being. Uh, so, for example, I drink uh, some water, and the water becomes part of me, and then later on I sweat it out, and it looks like there's just one single water molecule throughout. On the Unitarian view, that can't be right, because whatever part I have is essentially a part of me. It doesn't have its own identity, and so when it becomes a part of me, whatever was there before ceases to exist. And whenever something is removed from me, it's not just a part of me is now on its own, so something entirely new has come into existence. And indeed, here's an argument from too many water molecules. If the Unitarian view is right, then when I drink a glass of water and later wipe a few drops of sweat off my brow, there is no water molecule that undergoes this entire process. Instead, there are the water molecules that I drink, the virtual water molecules that are then parts of me, and then there are the entirely new water molecules that are wiped from my brow. But this seems like too many water molecules. Isn't it simpler to just say that there is just one molecule, molecule, water molecule in this story which has its own substantial form? What about the version of uh, pluralism, or the plurality of substantial forms, which says that the body has its own substantial form, that there is a substantial form of corporeity? What are some reasons for thinking that this one is true? Well, here's an argument from appearances. It certainly looks like the body left behind at death is the same body that was there before. It certainly doesn't look like anything new popped into existence, but on the Unitarian view, something has. Here's one that medievals uh, found somewhat persuasive. Occam pitched something like this argument, the argument from sameness of accidents. A dead human body has many of the same accidental features that the living body had, its color, its size, its shape, its weight. But if there's nothing that persists through the death of the human being, then this fact is unexplained. It is sheer coincidence. No, notice once again that on um, the Unitarian view, even the accidents of material substance can't survive the death of that thing. And so whatever's there have to be brand new qualities, not the same. And lastly, here's one theological argument for something like a form of corporeity. The argument from the entombment of Christ's body. Christ's body remained in the tomb for three days after his death on the cross. But if the Unitarian view is correct, then no body survived the death of Christ. Whatever is in that tomb was a completely new thing. It wasn't the body of Christ. It was something else. That might be a challenging theological reason to think that the pluralist view has to be right, that we are theologically committed to it. But maybe put less force on the theological arguments. The medievals were very interested in these ones, but take a look at some of the main philosophical reasons, right? We have the argument from internal conflict, we have the argument from generation of corruption, we have the argument from organ transplantation, um, we have the argument from empirical tracking and the too many water molecules, we have the argument from appearances, and the argument from sameness of accidents. All of these put together are some pretty serious reasons to think that we have to introduce more than one substantial form, and that Aquinas was wrong about this, to think that there's just one unifying form that makes all of the parts what they are. Well, all of this puts some real stress on the Unitarian view. Why does anyone hold the Unitarian view? Why does Aquinas hold the Unitarian view? This isn't, doesn't appear on your handout, doesn't appear on the transcript of the debate that I gave, but I can see at least two main arguments that Aquinas gives for the Unitarian view that and contemporary Unitarians might give in favor of something like his view. Um, the first view is what we might call the unity argument. According to Aquinas, is that if you have multiple substantial forms within you, because a substantial form is what makes something what it is, what you would be is several things. You would be a collection or set of smaller things and not one single thing at all. You'd be more like a sports team or a corporation than you would a full, united, singularly acting substance. 
And indeed, this is one of the biggest challenges for pluralism, is once you start introducing many substantive forms, then you've got to account for the apparent unity. It looks like I am one singularly acting thing. It looks like I have more unity than just the unity of a sports team or a corporation. And so what the pluralists have to do is they have to explain how to get something like that unity out of several different parts, which all of which have their own substantial forms. It's the unity argument. It's taken to be one of the strongest arguments in favor of the Unitarian view. If you deny that there's one substantial form and you've got a plurality, then there's the worry that how you're going to unite these into one thing. The worry is that once you introduce more than one substantial form, you're not going to have a single whole at all. You're that you, what you're going to do is you're just going to break down these holes into their smaller parts. You're going to get a kind of reductionist picture, according to which composite holes are just their parts loosely connected to one another. And so that might be a good reason to go in the direction of the Unitarian. The second argument that Aquinas gives in favor of Unitarian Unitarianism is something we might call the redundancy argument. So he thinks about what happens in a substantial change. What happens in a substantial change is that prime matter receives a substantial form. And once it receives a substantial form, ah, what we've got now is a substance. And so what he says is once you've got a substance, once you've got the key ingredients to make a particular substance, right? So you have prime matter and then you add a particular soul to create a particular kind of animal. You don't need any further substantial forms. Whatever form comes on that union would seem not to give it its essential existence, it's already got an essential existence. Whatever form comes on the scene after that would appear to just modify the existence it already enjoys. What Aquinas wants to say is that bringing in more substantial forms is redundant. You don't need to make something to belong to some essential kind if it already has something that makes it into essential kind. And so the way that he understands it is once you've got a substance on the scene, whatever form you add to it, it's got to be an accidental form, not a substantial form. It's already got substantial form. It's already got a principle of existence. It's already got a principle of its identity. It's already got something that places it within its essential kind. We don't need any further substantial forms. So that, there then are some arguments for and against the various plurality versus uh, unicity view. Aquinas gives two arguments in favor of unicity, the unity argument and the redundancy argument. And uh, the plurality folks give several arguments in favor of their view. Uh, as we see in Aquinas is on the Unitarian side, not a whole lot of medieval philosophers are willing to follow him to that strong Unitarianism. Scotus and Occam, two other authors that we're reading, are both on the plurality side, so that, though they disagree on how many forms and which forms you need to introduce to get around some of these other worries. Scotus seems to think that each of your organs has its own particular substantial form, though there are other passages in which he just seems to describe a form of corporeity. Akam, on the other hand, introduces multiple souls plus a form of corporeity, um, which is sort of an interesting addition there. So even within the pluralist camp, once you introduce more than one, then you've got a further question of, well, how many and which? Which side of this debate has the upper hand? Um, as a sort of Thomist, I'm really interested in shoring up the best arguments for the Unitarian view and responding as best as can be done to the arguments for plurality. But I take the arguments for the plurality of substantial forms very seriously. I think these are considerable arguments, and I don't know if I have good replies to all of them yet. Um, I'm interested in, I'll post this as a discussion topic on our Canvas page, which arguments you think are the most plausible or the most powerful in favor of plurality. Um, maybe also you're free to um, jump in and say how you think the Unitarian might respond to this nonetheless, if you could think of any way that they might. But I'm interested in your thoughts. What's your intuition? Is the Unitarian sort of coming out ahead? Are their arguments stronger? Are their arguments for pluralism better? And if so, which were the arguments that tipped you in favor of that view? Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts. So that's the plurality of substantial forms debate. It predates Aquinas. Aquinas takes a very strong Unitarian view. And afterwards, right, the debate rages on. Some of the followers of Aquinas defend his Unitarian view, whereas most others will go for some kind of plurality. The second metaphysical debate with respect to hylomorphism that I want to talk about here um, is the metaphysical composition of angels debate. Um, so we've heard already Aquinas' account of uh, 
how you sort of compose angels or what are the key ingredients that angels have. Uh, I want to set up the argument more generally um, by describing when what the goals are of an account of the metaphysical composition, composition of angels is, and what are the three main views that try to meet all these goals, but in different ways. So why would you try to come up with a metaphysical description of what angels are composed of? Well, you might do it to describe what's different about God. And so you might talk about how angels are composed, that is, what sort of key parts they have. Now, angels don't have like physical parts like arms and legs. But the question is, well, do they have form and matter? Are they composed of essence and existence, potency and act, uh, accident and substance? These are the sorts of questions we're asking about angels is what sort of parts they have. I said one of the motivations for looking into this is to try to see how angels are different even from God, how God's sort of simplicity is even more robust even than an angel's. So one of the things that you want out of, a, out of an account of the metaphysical composition of angels, is you want a way to, way to preserve the uniqueness of God's simplicity. God alone is supposed to be ultimately or radically simple, such that he has no metaphysical composition whatsoever. But the other thing you want out of a metaphysical composition of angels is you want to describe what's different between angels and us. Angels, right, are in some sense different, and not just about in ways in which they act, in ways in which they're related to time. It seems like they just have different sorts of parts than we do. And so what you're aiming for here is a sweet spot in the middle for a metaphysical composition of angels. What you want is an, is an account that properly distinguishes the way that angels are composed from the way that God is composed or not. And you also want to, uh, uh, an account that distinguishes between the way in which angels are composed and the way in which human beings are composed, so as not to just collapse those two categories. And there are three main views that try to do this within the medieval period. There's the view called universal hylomorphism, there's a view called local hylomorphism, and there's a view that I'm calling imperfect simplicity. Now let me run through each one of these quickly. Universal hylomorphism, which is a view um, advocated by St. Bonaventure and also another medieval Jewish philosopher called Avisabron, um, whom Aquinas actually cites. Aquinas and Bonaventure are writing on this particular issue and debating about it in real time. Um, they are contemporaries. But Avisabron comes a, a bit before Aquinas, and Aquinas responds to his works already written. According to the universal hylomorphic view, Angels, right, the reason why it's called the universal hylomorphism is that it says that angels, too, are composed of both matter and form. Universal hylomorphism, that all created things have a composition of matter and form. And so the way to break down the angel's constituents on this view is that an angel is composed of an essence, which includes both matter and form, and an existence. Within the essence, what you have is a certain kind of matter, Sometimes the authors call this something like spiritual matter. It is maybe not the same kind of matter that we have, um, but it is matter nonetheless. And the form that they possess within their essence is, like other things, a substantial form. And they possess their existence. Um, so you might say that, that um, within an angel, you still do have a distinction between its essence, what it is, and its existence, that it is. Also within this view, you might also say that the powers or other accidents that an angel has, it has an intellect and will, and it engages in various activities, has have various thoughts, those might be packaged in with the parts as well. Now, why think that this is the right view? Why think that angels have to be composed of both form and matter? Well, a couple of the arguments that, say, Bonaventure gives, uh, maybe the two principal ones he gives, are that we ought to think that angels also have matter because angels can change. They can change their thoughts. They can change their wills. And matter is supposed to be the principle of change. Form is supposed to be what remains, um, uh, what, what uh, changes, um, sometimes remains uh, in certain cases a substantial form, but an accidental change, right? The forms are supposed to change. But what's supposed to be the thing that persists throughout? Matter is supposed to be the potency of anything that allows it to change in various ways throughout. In some way, the substantial form is the principle of constancy. Matter has got to be the principle of change. It's got to be the thing in a thing that allows it, that gives it the capacity, the potency, to be different than how it is. 
The second argument that Bonaventure gives is he thinks that angels must have some kind of matter within them because they are individuated from one another. We have several different, lots of different angels. And in order to make them distinct from one another, you have to introduce something like matter because matter is the principle of individuation. Um, the standard line here, um, though, as we've seen, Scotus would disagree with that, this, is that forms are what is common to things of the same type. But matter is what individuates them. Both you and I have um, a substantial form. Uh, we have an essence uh, of humanity. We are both human beings, and so we both have a common humanity. What makes us different is that I am humanity plus a particular portion of matter over here, and you are humanity plus a particular portion of matter over there. And so Bonaventure wants to say the same thing about angels, is that in order to individuate them from one another, the forms are what make them the same, matter has to be what individuates them. So it has to have, the angels have to have some kind of matter within them. The second view is called local hylomorphism. As opposed to universal hylomorphism, this view says that angels do not possess any kind of matter within their composition. Matter form composition only pertains to material things. Proponents of this view include uh, uh, St. Albert the Great, the teacher of Aquinas, and St. Thomas Aquinas himself. On this view, angels are composed of an essence, which just is their substantial form, no matter in that, and their existence, and perhaps also their powers and other accidents. Now, why does Aquinas think that angels have to be completely lacking in matter? Uh, here are a couple of arguments. One, he says, because angels are pure intellects, understanding solely by means of intelligible species, which he argues cannot be received in matter. And so if these angels are pure intellects, totally uh, cognizing through uh, uh, understanding of concepts, then they can't have any matter within them, right? Because the matter would get in the way of their being able to cognize certain things. Now, this is less of an argument for thinking that um, angels don't have any matter, but it's a reason that Aquinas gives for thinking that we don't need to introduce matter in order to individuate angels. The way that Aquinas does this, right, St. Thomas, the angelic doctor, uh, St. Bonaventure uh, being the seraphic doctor, uh, because angels, what he wants to say is that what makes one angel different from another is not some matter, not some further principle of individuation other than its form. What Aquinas wants to say is that each individual possesses its own distinct essence. What that means is that each angel is in a different species than every other. There are no two angels that fall within the same species. They are not different individuals in the same species. Each angel is the one and only member of its own species. Well, that's sort of a bold view. I mean, aren't there like classes or hierarchies of angels? Aquinas needs to try to accommodate that language that comes up in scripture and the tradition, while also saying, strictly speaking, each angel is the one and only member of its own species. Say, so Bonaventure has an easier time with understanding how there could be angels within the same class, because he can say that they're straightforwardly members of the same species, they have the same essence, or in, they have, in that they have the same form, but they differ in their matter. The third view is what I'm calling the imperfect simplicity uh, view. This view is championed by Godfrey of Fontaine, uh, which, who was a well-known student of Aquinas. Not an official student, but apparently he had gone to some of his lectures and taken from him and was heavily influenced by him. Godfrey of Fontaine um, often defends Aquinas' views on various topics, but here he disagrees with St. Thomas on the composition of angels. According to the imperfect simplicity view, an angel is composed of an essence, just is its substantial form, and that's it. And um, maybe also if we wanted to bring in there some of its powers and its accidents. But Godfrey of Fontaine um, wants to take it a step further. Aquinas denied that there's any matter in angels. Godfrey of Fontaine wants to deny any real distinction in an angel between its essence and its existence. He wants to say that in an angel we have an essence of substantial form and we might have some particular accidents and that essence is limited in some sense but it doesn't even doesn't mean that we need this further component the existence in order to explain what's different about an angel than god as godfrey explains because we don't need to introduce any kind of composition in angels in order to explain how they are less than god angels are less than god in that they are contingent beings they don't necessarily exist in the fullest sense, and that they are limited in their existence 
and in their power. Godfrey thinks that's enough to distinguish angels from God, and certainly they'd be distinct from human beings in that they lack matter form composition. So what we see in these three views then is a sort of spectrum. On the one hand, some uh, views place matter in angels as matter is found in human beings. Maybe a slightly different kind of matter, but matter nonetheless. And so we find Bonaventure and Abyssin adding a lot of metaphysical complexity to angels. Aquinas wants to shorten that list of parts so that there's no matter in an angel, whereas someone like Godfrey or Fontaine wants to, wants to say that oh, I'm going to trim the parts down even further. All we have in angels are their substantial forms and perhaps their powers and other accidents. But that's it. And so the debate is how much complexity do you need to introduce within angels in order to make them distinguish from the, in order to distinguish them from the ultimate simplicity that God has, but also to distinguish them from the more robust complexity that human beings have. It's an interesting sort of debate. It's a question about how far the theory of hylomorphism stretches and how real Aquinas' distinction is between existence and essence really is.